Thank you for coming by, David. Uh, like I mentioned in the previous fireside chat, for me, one of the interesting parts about being in blockchain is that there's lots of people from different backgrounds coming into blockchain. And in your case, it seems that it's a perfect fit for you because you're a cryptographer. So I was wondering how you first found out about blockchain and how you got involved in the community? Yeah, it was, it was definitely a good fit for me. Um, I was already very interested in cryptography, um, internetworking, um, and I was also interested in secure messaging and those types of applications. And I also had a kind of personal interest in the way money moves and, and finance. So it was always just an area of interest for me. So when I was looking for something interesting to do back in the uh, mid-2011, um, I found uh, StumbleUpon, which is like a website where you tell it what you're interested in and it tells, it, it tells you what it thinks you should be interested in. And I guess I had the right combination because I told it that I was interested in things like cryptography and computers and mo money. And of course, like, that's a natural fit for Bitcoin. I mean, it's like, a, you know, it's like an absolute perfect fit. And when I found it, I, I immediately kind of realized that that, that was like the next thing. That was something that just really resonated with me, solving you know, real problems with um, sort of the control over money and the democratization of the, of the movement of money. I was very inspired by the internet, which kind of democratized the flow of information. I know as, unfortunately, in the past couple of years, that's kind of reversed as we've seen companies like Facebook and Twitter who have kind of undemocratized the movement of information. But this was a more ideal time, and uh, we were kind of more seeing that big media companies and big music companies weren't these sort of gatekeepers of access to information. And I was very inspired by the idea that big companies might no longer be the sort of gatekeepers of access to finance. Uh, and how did you make your way to Ripple? What, what attracted you to Ripple in the first place? Um, it was kind of just a matter of being in the right place at the right time. Um, I was very interested in looking at the mechanics of uh, the Bitcoin system um, as a kind of, a, a, from a kind of an engineering background, when someone presents you with like a complete solution, like it doesn't matter if it could be a car or it could be a computer, like if you're an engineer, you don't just want to know like what does it do, but you really want to know how it does it. What are the pieces that it have? How, how do they work together? If it does something that you think is interesting or useful, how, how is it that it does that? Is there some better way that you could do that? Kind of very analytical. And I was in that mindset looking at Bitcoin, looking at certain things that it did. Like one thing that I think was enormous was this idea that every participant just verifies everything. This idea that you don't take anybody else's word for anything. That, that as long as we all know the rules that a system should follow, we can all enforce them. And, and that, was, um, that was tremendously inspiring to me. And as luck would have it, um, Jed McCaleb at the time was, was starting to look at uh, this idea of pr proof of work. And I think we were, a lot of people in the industry were starting to realize that proof of work wouldn't be as decentralizing and democratizing as we'd hoped because someone's going to have the cheapest power, someone's going to have the best ASICs, and it, it just, it wasn't, it wasn't, it, we had this idea that everybody would be able to mine. Like if you had some extra computing power, you could just mine and make money, and that was very naive. And we were starting to look at systems that didn't have some of the centralizing influence of proof of work and, uh, and, and sort of like a bridge between um, the modern financial system and Bitcoin. Because Bitcoin was kind of like an island. It was this thing that like if everybody used Bitcoin, it would be great. But how do you, I, I used to joke that there's a couple of trillion dollars locked up in legacy fiat assets, right? Like, like dollars and euros. Like you can't ignore those things. And I found a lot of like-minded people and, uh, and we built what, what's now Ripple. So one of the interesting things that I find about Ripple is that unlike, well, Bitcoin was made for payments, but then it got, it got all of this scalability and, uh, and just efficiency problems that they're still working out. And then Ethereum was built for decentralized apps as well as cryptocurrency. But Ripple seems to be focusing specifically on, on developing itself as a payment protocol. How did that decision come? And what are some of the trade-offs that you had to make to keep yourself as a payment company rather than something else that can ex expand into decentralized apps and all of these other infrastructures and, and ideas? So, so as, as any company that's been in this space as long as Ripple has, and really even companies that haven't been in this space that long, we kind of figured out as we were going along what we wanted, you know, what we wanted to be and what, where the technology would lead us. I think our very early vision, like almost from the very beginning, was this idea of a sort of cross-currency system, a system that wasn't based on everybody using the exact same currency as their everyday currency, 
but was more built on interoperability, this idea that if I had dollars and I wanted to pay someone euros, there should be some system that makes that easy. We kind of got to that position both because that was an interesting problem and also when we first built um, what we call consensus, a sort of distributed agreement protocol, the way we solved the double spend problem, one of the first things that you do when you build something new is you try, to, you try to figure out what properties it has and then what problems those properties are good for. So like if you invented a new material, you might say, well, like, is it light? Is it cheap? Is it strong? Is it resistant to rust? If, does it have some set of properties that, that make it useful for something? And one of the first things that we discovered is that distributed agreement protocols like consensus don't have some dictator that gets to choose what transactions go in every block like Bitcoin does. And, and, and what that's good for is a, de is a decentralized exchange. Because if you're going to have a decentralized exchange built on top of proof of work, the miner who mines each block can game the exchange by ordering the transactions inside that block. So if I place an offer to trade two assets and the market has moved against me, the miner can say, oh, no, you can't cancel that offer. I'm actually going to take it, and I'm going to resell that at a worse price. Like, he can game the system for each block that he mines. And decentralized exchanges built on top of platforms like Ethereum have had that kind of problem with front running and exchange gaming. So when we realized that we had built a system that didn't have those particular vulnerabilities, we said, okay, what problem, what's the problem where those vulnerabilities are the most serious than if you have a system that doesn't have them? And that was cross-currency payment. And that's kind of evolved into the company the way it is today with this sort of institutional payment side and this sort of decentralized um, you know, digital asset side and then connecting them together and taking institutional payments from financial institutions that are all regulated and they do all the KYC and everything. And then on the other side, you've got this digital asset that anybody can hold and trade. And if we, you can prove that you can connect those two things together to build a sort of global liquidity pool. So yesterday, I kind of, I saw you walking around and you were talking with one of the attendees. And uh, one of the things that struck me, I, I kind of listened in on the conversation. You were talking about including everyone in the cryptocurrency space, as well as including banks and financial institutions, which wasn't how you initially got started with the field, because you mentioned you were looking in the ways how we can democratize that technology and take some of the power away from banks. Uh, but recently, Ripple launched a pilot with, with a, a number of banks for a new system called uh, X. Current, I believe, or was it XRapid, the one? Um, you could be talking about either of those two systems. So XCurrent is a payment product that allows banks to complete payments with bi-directional messaging. XRapid settles through XRP. Yeah, so there was some criticism about XCurrent that basically the banks are not really using XRP, but that's not exactly the case. Can you elaborate on that and how, uh, and how banks are using that system? Sure. So at first, there, there really wasn't enough liquidity available. There really, the, crypto, the crypto exchanges weren't mature enough. It just wasn't realistic to settle through a digital asset directly. And so we focused on improving the payment system because that, 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 the payment systems that people have were just very slow and they were unidirectional. So like if you look at a payment system like Swift, you sort of push a message out into the world and you kind of hope it gets to where it's supposed to go. And then the money moves completely separately. So um, we... We, focus, we wanted to be able to settle through a digital asset, but you have to have the payments first. You kind of have a chicken and egg problem. If you don't have any payments, you're not going to get any liquidity. But if you don't have any liquidity, there's nothing you can do with the payments. So in, in the short term, we focused on the X current side, which is a payment system for banks. It's kind of like does what Swift does. It does the messaging, but it's, it's faster. It doesn't have the failure rate that Swift has. And then we started to build, as you're just starting to see now, now that the digital currency side is more mature, now that the liquidity is, is available, now that the values are high enough, you're starting to see us deliver on that sort of original vision of settling those payments with the digital asset. So that the payment can take place inside this sort of regulated space, but then the, there's a movement of XRP between sort of two regional liquidity hubs. And that's exactly what we're delivering today with XRapid. One of the other criticisms that often comes at your way is that basically the system is not so accessible to the general user. And I know we have a developer in our company who is currently developing a wallet for Ripple. And I was wondering, do you have any plans to open up the, system, the payment systems to users more broadly in the near future? And what are you doing to make that happen? I think in, in at least the near future, you're going to continue to see the separation. You're going to continue to see on the one side, there's like this payment network that's, that institutions participate in. And the reason for that is because of regulatory compliance issues and just because it's just they're, they're, the, we can't force banks to open up their processes. And the beautiful part is that we don't have to. If we can make the liquidity, if we can make the place where the actual value, where the money moves is open, 
then it doesn't matter as much that the other system is closed. So you can still participate in the liquidity pools. You can contribute to them. You can draw off them. And then if we can move those institutional payments through them, then you can get the benefit. I guess an analogy might be the internet. Like in the early days of the internet, traditional information providers just opened up websites. They were very similar to what they had always done. They weren't, they weren't um, participatory. It was like the New York Times would let you read the New York Times just like they always did. An airline would let you, you know, book a flight just like you always did. And what happened over time is that as they realized that there were other things that they could do on the new platform, they started to take advantage of those features because if they didn't, their competitors would. And I think you're going to see the same thing start to happen. We're kind of early in that phase where where like, the large institutions don't feel competitive pressure to act in this space yet. And so they're just looking for advantages in customer acquisition or customer retention, or can they provide better service, or those kinds of things. They're not yet really feeling the competitive pressure that would make them innovate really new products yet. But that will, that will happen. That's sort of the inevitable path in technology. It's first like, what is it? What does it do? How does it solve the problems that we know we have better? And then that sort of third step that we're not in yet, which is like, what does this technology enable us to do that we could never do before? Like the Twitters and the Facebooks of the internet. We don't yet have those in the cryptocurrency space. How long do you think it's going to take to get there? And what do you think is going to need to happen other than what you already mentioned? I, I, th I think it takes, like, it takes an enormous number of people. It takes a lot of interest in the space. It takes talented people being attracted into the space. One of the fantastic things that I've, that I've seen recently is this trend of really talented people and people who have you know, ideas and inspiration moving into the space. You can sort of look at, like, at one time, the cool people, the people who knew what they were doing, the people who were real innovators were working at Apple or Microsoft, and then they kind of moved into Facebook, and then they kind of moved into Uber. There was like this idea that this was the area where the innovation was happening, where the money was flowing, and I think you're starting to see that become cryptocurrency, and I think that's what we're going to need if we're going to build these sort of visionary technologies that we can't see yet. I recently saw that uh, Ripple is opening up its platform. It's opening up a fund for developers so they can use that fund and build new applications on top of Ripple. Have you already opened up that, that, uh, the, the application process? And have you looked at any of the projects being submitted? Yeah, so that effort is called Spring. And that's a way to try to drive innovation on top of the XRP ledger so that, that we can bring new projects um, onto our ledger. And we are definitely, we're starting to look at um, different types of projects, people targeting different verticals, some of the same pitches that you're hearing you know, at this conference, and um, a lot of bad ideas, a lot of good ideas. One of the things that I've been doing as I've been traveling is talking to people about ideas on how to build on the XRP ledger. And it's kind of funny. I, I've had the same conversation many times where I'll talk to someone, and they'll tell me what business they're in. And they'll say, I have this idea for how we should build on top of the XRP ledger. And I'll tell them, that's a terrible idea. You don't understand the ledger at all. Maybe you should do this. And they would tell me, that's a terrible idea. You don't understand my business at all. <laughs> and, and, and we would exchange progressively less and less terrible ideas, right? And, and sometimes there's not a fit. And so, or sometimes it's just a person who's looking to make a quick buck, and he just doesn't actually have a real use case. He doesn't have a real problem that he, that he wants to solve. He's just like, I heard that you can raise $140 million with a white paper. That's, that's not a good thing. Uh, but in many of those cases, those things will turn into, will turn into uh, deals for, for, for spring where we work out some kind of arrangement with them where we incentivize them to develop on top of the platform. If there was one, is there one project that you, you're particularly fond of at that stage? And would you share why, what the project might be about and why, you're, why you find it so interesting at that point? Well, I have to say that the one that I find the most interesting is the one that um, has been close to my heart for some time, which is um, Interledger and, and Coil. And what Interledger is, is it's an interoperability solution. There's kind of an irony here that a lot of us came into this space because we didn't like siloed liquidity. It's like if, if you have PayPal and I have American Express or you have this you know, mobile system in Kenya, nothing connected to itself. And the irony is, is that we, real, we rebuilt that same problem. We have something like 1,500 tokens and you can't, they, they, don't, they don't interoperate. So we reinvented the very same problem that we try, we're trying to solve. Interledger is a light interoperability protocol that coordinates transactions between ledgers, and it doesn't care what those ledgers are. They can be blockchains, they can be traditional banking ledgers, anything that can track value. Now, that's an idea for sort of developing a protocol like TCPIP. It's not a business, per se, because there's no token, there's no revenue model. Coil is pursuing a particular business on top of that technology, which is paying for content. So rather than having ads and paywalls, 
you would be able to pay for content by streaming micropayments using an interoperability protocol. And because it's an interoperability protocol built around a web payment standard, it can connect to whatever, any payment system that interoperates with that standard. So you could potentially pay with Bitcoin or pay with euros or pay with anything that plugs into that standard. One thing I particularly like about you is that you often discuss the idea of building, building software that, that is, first of all, can be trusted and a software that cannot be uh, spoiled or tainted with by bad actors. And I was wondering, when you, when, you build, when you build software like that, what is something that goes into your mindset? And how do you make sure that even if you go away from the project, or let's say you turn, you turn into a bad person, and you want to hurt the project, how can you make sure that this cannot happen? That's actually something that I've thought about a lot. Originally, not very directly, because I didn't realize that that was one of the problems I was solving. It's kind of that irony where you're solving a problem and you don't really realize what you're doing until a little bit later. As, as you get further along, you realize, oh, this is the real problem, and this is actually the real solution. And that is, one that, that, that is an issue that I've thought a lot about lately. And what I've discovered is that it's actually easier than you might think. What you need is only a small number of properties to protect the system from being controlled by bad actors. So one of them is that the technology has to be open. There can't be some secret sauce that only somebody has, because then if that person becomes a bad actor, the system can't free itself of them. Um, and you have to have sort of short-term self-governance, like systems like Bitcoin, XRP, all of these systems have short-term self-governance. In other words, if the people who have been honest in the past remain honest for the short-term future, the system will continue to work. We don't have to worry minute to minute about finding bad actors. And then what you need is freedom, an absence of coercion. So if the system, let's say you're running a system and you become a bad actor, well, as long as I have the freedom to say, I'm just not going to listen to you anymore, I'm just going to substitute somebody else, and your system is going to go be bad, and our system will be good. As long as there's, there's no coercion in the system, there's nothing that forces me to go along with rules I don't like, then I always have that ultimate ability to just ignore the bad actors and just sort of, whether it's a fork or whatever it is technically in the system. The interesting thing is nothing I just said is about the technology. Nothing is really about proof of work or, or proof of stake or distributed agreement. It's structural rules like the freedom of choice that make these systems very democratic and allow them to just either vote out or ignore bad actors. As long as they have no authority or no secret, that they, as long as they can't take their something and go home with it and leave us all you know, high and dry, as long as they don't have any special control, then ultimately we're just completely free to change the rules as we need to. That's also sort of the weakness in these systems. So like, how do you know that these systems will, will have the properties you want them to have tomorrow just because they have them today? You just have to hope that the actors want them to because you can't, you have no legal arm, you have no central authority. So it is very democratic. Thank you very much for being with us. I think we're going to end on that note because we're running out of time. It was a tremendous pleasure to have you nice on the stage with us.